I definitely enjoyed reading the farm arc of Vinland Saga as I was waiting for season two. But now that the anime adaptation has come along, I think it's time we take a look at what might just be one of the most profound arcs in anime history. All right. What do people really get for all their hard work? I have seen the burden God has placed on us all. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. Vinland Saga is having an extremely profound effect on people's lives. It's breaking boundaries and it's opening up conversations most people might not have, cons have considered possible for anime in the past. I think even a lot of people who were not really into anime have gotten into this show because this show has got a really profound impact on how it approaches topics of war, peace, and improving one's sense of character. There's a reason why the main motto of the show is you have no enemies. And there's a reason why so many people were deeply moved by a scene that I've analyzed about the previous season on this channel, the scene where Willibald the priest talks about agape love and how his sense of agape love remains untainted even when Canute misinterprets that agape love. We will bear it all without a single complaint. For death is what truly completes a human being. But anyway, I could, there's so much to talk about with Vinland Saga Season 2. Like, where do I even begin? Where, where do I even start? The fact that it's got such deep thematics that are deeply relevant for today's society. The fact that it's got gorgeous, beautiful animation. The fact that they've kept the brilliant, the engaging music and even added in some new tracks. The fact that they've added in a few meaningful new scenes that were not in the manga. There's so much to discuss, so let's get started, I guess. However, before we delve further into, before I delve into season two, I have to give this warning. Major spoilers for season one. If you haven't seen the prologue arc of Vinland Saga, aka the first season, aka the war arc, of Vinland Saga, I would highly recommend you view season one first before jumping into season two. And I would also highly advise you pay attention to the slow paced scenes of season one or even pieces of dialogue in between battles in season one because it'll help you make sense of what season two is going for. But in order to discuss season two, we have to discuss a major spoilers for season one. So go watch season one if you haven't seen it already. You have been warned. Okay, so at the end of season one, up until that point, to recap the story, this is set during a time where Viking Europe was drastically converting to um, new forms of lifestyle which moved away from Viking savagery. This was a time where a lot more Vikings were converting to Christianity, but there was still a lot of savagery going around. This was a time where there was deep political conflict between different sides in Denmark and England and other places. And even though this is historical fiction, it does nevertheless capture that savage, brutal piece of history of the Dark Ages where some of the worst aspects of humanity definitely came to light, but there was so much goodness of humanity that called to a higher state of being that got people to change profoundly. And this, this the time period of the story is sort of the, the sort of the segue between that, although I suppose you could say all of life is pretty much a segue like that. But anyway, 
The story focuses on a fictional account of Thorfinn, a man who was known for visiting Vinland. The story is essentially what motivates Thorfinn to find Vinland, to found fin Vinland. Um, the story is about how Thorfinn hears these magnificent stories of his friend Leif Erikson's visits to a land so vast and without war and without slavery, Vinland, which we now know as America. And Thorfinn's father, Thors, was trying to lead a peaceful life, but unfortunately his past life of being a warrior caught up with him as he was betrayed by his former colleague, I guess, Floki, who, and Floki hired a pirate and his band of misfits called Askelad. Askelad um, killed off Thor's orphan so much that a child Thorfinn began to chase down Askelad and try to kill him in a duel for revenge. He didn't want to assassinate him, so he waited until he, Thorfinn got the chance to challenge Askelad in a duel for honor. Askelad agrees to these conditions, but he gets Thorfinn to do something in exchange, do this and that for him, and then he can get the chance to uh, have a duel with him. Now, unfortunately, Thorfinn got so carried away with his pursuit of revenge that he ended up doing what Askeladd did pretty much constantly. Thorfinn ended up killing so many people who were mostly innocent. He ended up killing families just trying to make peace, and Thorfinn killed many more families, which kind of makes Thorfinn a hypocrite, which really haunts Thorfinn for reasons we'll explain later. But later on in the conflict, Askeladd, being the opportunist that he is, finds an opportunity to save his homeland of Wales by interfering with an epic war to take Prince Canute as part of his own and then selling him off for big amounts of cash. A lot of stuff happens, but to make a long story short, Ascala does eventually get Canute in one piece to uh, the throne room of King Swain. Swain who didn't really want his son to be alive as far as I can recall, and Swain, having picked up knowledge of Askeladd's history as a slave, threatened to overtake Wales if he didn't uh, kill off uh, Canute. Uh, now, Askeladd refused to sacrifice Wales, and he wanted Canute to be king, so Askeladd did the only um, thing that his rebellious mind could think of, and that was kill off the king right in front of the royal court in the, in the throne room. So this not only gives Canute the opportunity to take the throne, but this also means Askeladd is, uh, in a way, sacrificing himself, however flawed of a character he is, so that Canute can raise the throne so that Askeladd can save Wales. So in this scene that he creates, with Thorfinn desperately trying to get one last chance to have a duel with Askeladd, Askeladd gets killed by Canute as part of the act so that uh, Canute can attain the throne. This leaves Thorfinn in a deep state of devastation, but Askeladd tells Thorfinn something that really haunts him. What are you going to do after I'm dead? And Askeladd once again proves that Thorfinn really wasn't thinking in the long term. Thorfinn really wasn't thinking about what he was going to do after he finally got his revenge. And so Askeladd uh, dies, and now Thorfinn, his entire pursuit of revenge was meaningless. All those people he killed to try to get a duel with Askeladd was meaningless. His entire phase, years worth of being blinded by rage, was meaningless, and now, in his last moments of rage, he tries striking out at Canute, scarring his face, and ends up getting enslaved. And later on, Thorfinn just doesn't try to escape, he just accepts his fate. Thorfinn, at this point in the story, is now 
a completely empty husk of a man. Completely empty husk. Thorfinn is just not the same person he once was. I mean, he's all that rage is gone and all that's left is just this, this husk of emptiness. And this is where the slave arc of Vinland Saga begins. So, this arc of Vinland Saga begins, if you're reading the manga, the first part actually begins at the end of the fourth book of the series, where we are introduced to the character of Einar, a strong Englishman who became enslaved himself before being sold off to the farm of Kettle, where Thorfinn works as a slave. Leif Erikson and his adopted son, um, also named Thorfinn, but nicknamed Bug Eyes, is looking for uh, Thorfinn, but as no luck find, doesn't have any fortune in finding Thorfinn. But Einar meets Thorfinn, and Oops. intriguing uh, scenes happening. For instance, the entire first episode is an extension of uh, book, the ending of book four, where before we just had Einar and the slave ship and then being sold the slave market. Here we have an extended scene which gives more sympathy and meaning to Einar's character. I suppose when you have a story of well-established characters, there's a risk of um, trying to get people to sympathize with the new characters. But hey, I suppose it's not entirely impossible. If you can get people to sympathize with the original characters in the first place, it shouldn't be too difficult to introduce new characters as long as they contribute something meaningful to the story. Unfortunately, Einar does, and a lot of people seem to really latch on to Einar. Uh, Einar is shown in this show to have a family, uh, a mother and a sister, all before the Vikings mess things up, as they do, and they kill off his poor sister and his poor mother, and they sell off Einar into slave slavery. Um, this a sympathetic perspective gives audiences some emotional attachment in in order to have an emotional perspective on Thorfinn, who in this current state is lacking emotion because he's so empty. It's a rather clever storytelling device now that I look back at it, because um, with Einar, you can have someone that the audience can relate to in order to express the situation of being a slave and someone to bounce off with Thorfinn and his current predicament. And also the fact that Einar and Thorfinn do become such strong uh, brothers in arms later on down the line. So Einar is very meaningful in this way. And Thorfinn later corrects Einar in several things, but we'll get to that later. So in this story, Thorfinn and Einar have to work uh, several years as a slave. So they agree and they work away. Thorfinn gets Einar familiar with uh, the work enforcement and they get familiar with some of the other residents around Kettle's farm. They have the uh, um, Kettle's father, uh, Zverkel, who is an elder in the farm who still helps out with farming from time to time. You have uh, Kettle's two sons, um, Olmar, a rather... Um, a doofus um, coming of age person who's really immature at this point in the story but will mature later on due to a series of events. You have his other son who is practically built for war, which will also contribute to the story. You have the servant Snake who's presumably had some past being a warrior. And sadly, no, is not voiced by David Hayter, as far as I'm aware. And you have several other worksmen who have similar code names. Um, Thorfinn and Einar are often bullied by some of the other workers just for some brutal fun. But it's here we get some insight into Thorfinn 
not just on the brutality, but on the way Thorfinn reacts to the brutality, and that Thorfinn almost doesn't resist at all, even almost replicating Vincent van Gogh at one scene. Thorfinn just doesn't love himself. He doesn't see any worth in anything, or he sees no worth in himself because nothing good has ever happened to him and he's done nothing good to contribute to life. He's, it, later on the show, it, it's clear that he's haunted by his past. He admits to Einar that he's been a warrior, which really angers Einar, but Einar later comes to sympathize with Thorfinn as it's revealed that Thorfinn, as emotionless as he is, is having intense nightmares at nighttime about all the sins that he's committed in the past. It's clear that having failed to kill Askeladd, not only has it made Thorfinn realize just how meaningless his pursuit of revenge was in the long term. Not only, it, it wasn't just the fact that he failed to get his revenge that haunts him. It's the fact that he spent all those years doing that and only now is he being haunted by all those people that he killed and this all those years that he's wasted and it really eats at him but through this farmland arc Thorfinn eventually opens up to Einar more and more but due to the bullies interfering with their farm work Thorfinn unleashes his anger but he gets knocked unconscious at one point and it leads to a an extremely brilliantly written scene where Thorfinn has full recollection. Thorfinn has a full recollection of what his dream was about. It's honestly, it's one of the best scenes in the entire story. Thorfinn has a dream where he wakes up to a la his home place of peace with his father, only for his father to haunt him by saying, I smell blood. Who did you kill with those swords? And it's really sinking in what his father meant by you have no enemies. The term you have no enemies, it's not just a pacifist mantra. It's also this method of self-improvement. It's not just a way of avoiding conflict. It's also meant to reassess the way you perceive conflict. Because if you perceive all other human beings as if they are not your enemies. You're not going to approach them as monsters that have to be overcome, but loved ones to be reached out to. And Thorfinn is haunted by this, and he... And there's, um... I find it interesting how there's variations of this scene uh, in the manga as compared to the anime adaptation. In the anime adaptation, they emphasize a lot more on Thorfinn's relationship with Einar and Einar's um, past with um, with his sister and mother. As if to say, Thorfinn was essentially killing his best friend in a way, which it spiritually would make sense, because even if you hate someone, that's technically murder. Um, I mean, it seems a little bit extreme, but um, I find it I suppose there's some differences in the manga that are also worth taking into consideration. The fact that um, as Thorfinn's being dragged down by the corpses, um, he keeps his teenager form as if the form in which he was at his prime of sin was being dragged down, which would make thematic sense, but in the anime show it's just his adult self uh, being dragged down by the corpses, um, which would make sense in his state of regret. Um, but either way, he maintains his adult form when he goes down to Valhalla. Thorfinn, in his adult form, goes down to Valhalla, which is pretty much hell in the context of his dream. And this is a brilliant... Um, thematic point in the story because the first season was already challenging the pagan Viking ideology enough as it was. 
this whole idea of a true warrior and how a true warrior doesn't need a sword. Like, it's implied that Thor's maintained his Viking beliefs, but for some reason, Thor's insisted on a pacifistic lifestyle as if that was the way of a true warrior, even though, according to Viking beliefs, even acknowledged in the manga, Valhalla is this afterlife where Vikings who died in battle are taken up to um, Valhalla to await the Battle of Ragnarok. And here, Valhalla is portrayed as hell, like some violent level of Dante's Inferno or something. It's this hell where the violence never stops, the corpses are always laughing, always hating each other, and there's so much brutality, and it's a, it's a brilliant scene as if it's a, a wake-up call to what this brutal uh, world actually implies. And to make the scene even better, like, what a fan-favorite antagonist comes back in this scene, Askeladd himself, even though it's in the form of a dream, Askeladd and Thorfinn have a meaningful discussion about what this hell dimension symbolizes. It's basically a place where the violence never stops, and it's the kind of place where all people who initiate meaningless violence uh, go to. And Thorfinn reflects that he's gone there again because he lashed out at a bully. And then this pile of corpses comes up to try to grab Thorfinn. And these are all the people that Thorfinn killed. Askeladd kind of mocks him a little bit. But Askeladd's also correcting him. And it's interesting that Askeladd maintains most of his um, uh, human form. And standing on top of a pillar. As if Askeladd had some better sense in him than most of the other Vikings. But still was no better himself because he was still enacting a lot of this violence himself. And it's shown here that Thorfinn's clearly not the same person he was. He deeply regrets it, but... But now that he's pretty much an empty slate with how emotionless he's been, this could be seen as an advantage. As... You could see it as... Now that the slate is clean, this gives Thorfinn a new perspective to make some positive changes. To make some actual improvements into his life. To reach the goal that was previously perceived as unattainable. And it's a brilliant scene. And there's plenty of scenes like this all throughout Vinland Saga. And that's why so many people love this particular arc. You've got... I mean, I could go on and on about so many other characters, like uh, the slave Arnhide, who, who's got a really tragic life. I could go on about how Olmar goes as a character. There's also Canute and how he, in his um, corrupt utopian vision, um, does so many sleazy things in order to attain power. A lot of it, which is actually based on real history, by the way, he really did poison his brothers. Um, there's, um, so many arcs, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but basically, everything I just described, it's basically exactly like that, and it leads to some really meaningful character arcs and character growth, and I think it says a lot about the author's sense of dignity, as well as how impactful the show has been, when one of the fans' favorite scenes is not in some grandiose, elaborate battle scene. And not when someone gets some comeuppance or something like that. It's when Thorfinn deliberately chooses to have himself punched in the face 100 times just to get the chance to talk to King Canute. And it leads to a complete circle of his character arc where he declares... I have no enemies. It's it's brilliant. It's 
it's it's amazing. It's honestly, it's this has got to be one of my favorite manga series ever written. And what makes this even better is the fact that all these peaceful ideologies begin to come in and they are beginning to really take practice for some of these characters, like, you know, the whichever ones you relate to, um, they, they, like, you know, the stoicism, the uh, Christianity, especially personally for me, yeah, um, as well as for many other people, they really begin to sink in for Thorfinn, and Thorfinn learns that a life of peace and innocence, a life where you forgive your enemies, a life where you try to reach out to your enemies, even if they do horrible things to you, like beat up a pregnant woman, even if they beat you 100 times in the face, even if they bully you in the farms, even if they are hostile to you, even if they, there's so much horrible things done to you, even if all that happens, you can still make peace with them. And that's what makes this arc of Vinland Saga so beautiful. This, it, it, It's a beautiful story, honestly. I mean, it's true. The, the story does embellish itself in um, its uh, historical fictional side of things. <laughs> um, but unlike stuff like The Woman King, it, it doesn't really get caught up in ideologies that are harmful. It's trying to promote ideologies that are constructive. And it's all this is done with some beautiful animation, amazing music, honestly. Great thematics that go on throughout the show. It's honestly, it's, it's one of the best shows I've ever seen. I'm honestly going to rank this manga, this anime as one of like my top anime shows ever made and something i will say about the manga adaptation of season two is that there's some things that um i like about the manga exclusively which didn't really make a featured appearance in a season two like i find this scene kind of um sincerely funny in the fact that thorfinn just after he gets beaten to a pulp has to deal with the consequences of having his face get swollen as he leaves. I think that's quite funny. It's also quite heartfelt that he's humiliated in, in that way. I suppose in hindsight, I can guess why they removed that face swelling scene, just to focus more on the sentimentality of Thorfinn leaving some good friends behind and the impact he and Einar have had on the farm. Also, this brilliantly written scene of... Thorfinn and Einar growing as characters, growing closer to the Logos and having that famous handshake to lay the foundations for Vinland. That apparently happens before the battle, not really after the battle. And it's not really done in an overdramatic way like it is in the anime. So there is that to consider. So there's some slight differences between the manga and the anime, but I guess it makes the anime and, ma and manga worth reading for different reasons. I suppose, maybe in hindsight, it's kind of like the comparing the different dubs together. It kind of depends on uh, the overall delivery and the strengths and, that you would get from that sort of thing. <laughs> Great humor to be had. And some profound character development. Characters growing closer to the Logos. It's set in a time period where people were growing closer to the Logos. And I'm so glad that there's a story that, even though it may not be perfect, it does showcase the Logos in a positive way, I'm convinced. Side note, I have taken time to think this through a bit methodically. And yeah, I think the show does positively point to the Logos, even in this uh, corrupt setting. I have to confess something. I don't think the rock songs that were the openings of the first season of Vinland Saga fitted the show very well. I mean, don't get me wrong, those songs in the first season's openings were can be quite catchy and upbeat, depending on the mood, but I never really thought they accurately portrayed the tone that Vinland Saga was going for. I mean, Vinland Saga 
It's certainly action-packed and had quite a pace to it, but it wasn't really an altogether upbeat story. Oh, I mean, there were positive things in it. There were funny scenes in it. There's likable characters in it, but I think this, the, the songs, whilst they could personify the rage of Thorfinn at the stage of season one, I don't think they could accurately portray like the kind of historical story that Vinland Saga was going for. With that said, I think the openings of season two are a vast improvement. The openings are way better. The animations are far more stunning and eye-catching, and the songs are brilliant. I mean, yeah, sure, there's still modernized music, but I think this modernized music still um, fits with the tone of this story way better than the songs in the first season. I think uh, rock music can be great when done right, as, as well as uh, modern pop when done right. In the first half of season two, as these enemies go, you have this brilliant uh, song called River, which delves into the regretful mindset of Thorfinn and, and his um, eventual discovery that he needs to go out to find a new goal, a new purpose in life. And the opening has this very Bond type of visual presentation, which is very interesting. And we also see a contrast between uh, regretful Ooh, Thorfinn MDJ. and um, newcomer Einar as compared to the, the Chad <laughs> Einar and Chad Thorfinn <laughs> that they'll become uh, later on. Um, there's also, funnily enough, a rock song in the second half of season two. Now, this is the part where most of you would probably call me a hypocrite for say, ah, oh, but you said criticize the use of rock songs in the first season. Yeah, I did, but I think this rock song in the second half of season two's openings, um, I think it fits the tone of the story far better um, due to the way the the story, the song was, um, the tone of the song and the overall deliverance of the song. I think it fits better with this historical period and the type of story that Vinland Saga is going for way better if you ask me. Okay, so I also quite like the endings too. They, both of them are quite refl self-reflective and can lead people closer to the logos with songs like Without Love and Somewhere in the Distant, you know, and so on and so forth. There's some superb character arcs, and there's some characters you're going to absolutely love and adore, like the very tragically sweet Arnhide, um, and there's some characters that you may not like at first, but you'll warm up to later, like Snake and Ulmar. Some characters who are a bit cranky, but you, you warm up to like them, like a, like the grandpa, um, and uh, there's other characters who um, have some character arcs. Some of them, there are one or several characters who start off as um, fairly decent chaps, but later on down the line, they become absolute savages, which just shows you not only the cruelty of the world around them, but just this, the utter savagery that can come from the innate darkness within a human heart that doesn't align itself with the higher accountability. And we can see that in uh, Prince Canute, who is still ignoring the agape implications of what Willibald was trying to teach him. I'm pretty sure Willibald still kept his beliefs intact, even despite uh, Canute's um, um, corrupt utopian rise to power. Uh, feel free to have a conversation with me in the comments if you want for that. And it's really interesting um, to see all these different um, character dynamics at play here. One of the things I really liked about the first season was how all these different ideologies were clashing and how they were essentially having conversations with each other on how they think the world should be bettered. Something I've been learning in the past several years is that you need to align yourself with a higher accountability if you want to have any kind of improvement because if you only look to yourself to try to better the world, no matter how good your intentions are, 
you're not going to fix the problem, you're just going to become part of the problem, because as Vinland Saga reveals, the problem with the world is not always external, it's often internal, and that's very evidential in the main character himself, Thorfinn. Now, I suppose it's interesting, now that I mention it, that Thor I'm describing Thorfinn as a main character, because if you're being narratively honest, you could argue that the main character of season one wasn't really Thorfinn, nor even his, his dad Thor's. The main character of season one could arguably be Askeladd. I mean, that was the character that a lot of people really liked, even though he was the villain, he was very charismatic, and he had a motive, uh, he had a very distinct motivation, and a very distinct arc of his own. So it's very interesting in the context of the story that the main antagonists of the series, arguably, um, unless you're going to count Floki as the main antagonist, um, the main antagonist of the series, if you're going to describe him as Askeladd, has literally died after season one. So it's now a case of, well, now what? You're like the main action-oriented goal is achieved. What are you going to do now? And honestly, myself, my friend Brooks, and so many other people online can absolutely relate to Thorfinn. I have to sincerely ask the audience, especially those who are trying to get closer to the Logos, have you ever been through a period in your life where you did something? Pardon me, I farted. I'm going to edit that out. <laughs> Lord willing, pardon me. Pardon me. <clears throat> have you ever found yourself... Spirit, if you approve of anime, help me talk about this next point in peace into the mind. Have you as a person ever did something terrible that you may not have consciously described as terrible at the time, but through a series of events, you began to find out how wrong you were? Have you ever been through some kind of phase in life where it felt like you were fighting for something great when really you were the main cause of the problems of the world the whole time have you ever been through this intense sense of disillusionment about yourself and then went through this whole phase of closing yourself off from others and then only to then realize that you're not alone and then realizing that there's ways to improve the world, but the only way to really improve the world is to improve yourself more than trying to improve the world first. I guess it's very true what Michael Jackson says. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself, then make a change. Ooh, like in the Lego Batman movie. <laughs> uh, but anyway... If you've ever been through a phase like that, then you'll know exactly what Thorfinn, as portrayed in Vinland Saga here, went through. Like, Thorfinn goes through, goes through a lot, and there's a lot of things that could be discussed about the virtues of masculinity and stoicism and what it actually means to be a man, and how it's all about responsibility about how you better the world, how you harness that strength of yours to better the lives of, better yourself and have compassion on people around you, but also keeping them accountable as well. It's like what Jordan Peterson said about becoming a monster. It's not that you use your aggression to purposely cause violence. It's more so that you harness that fighting energy to improve yourself and to help others. We see that profoundly throughout this entire story, and honestly, it makes for a truly profound outlook on the story, especially with all the themes going into about how bit by bit, not necessarily overnight, unfortunately, but still progressively, Thorfinn gradually becomes a better person, and we see this transformation internally and externally, if you know what I mean. It starts off with something as basic as Thorfinn not seeing any value in himself, 
to Snake attacking him, and then Thorfinn, by sheer instinct, fights back. And then Snake says, aha, see? A part of you does want to live. And Thorfinn's like, oh, snap. Somewhere deep down inside, there's a part of me that wants to live. So if he, there's nothing good that he thinks he's ever done in his life, if he acknowledges that he's a sinner, if he sees the world as corrupt, and yet there's something inside of him that says there's something worth living for, and that he does not want to die at this moment, what does that mean? Those kind of questions would have, have bubbled over his head, as well as the regret that he feels deep in his soul regarding all the people that he pointlessly killed all for petty vengeance and then over time we see him have more compassion on others and forming a more of a brotherly bond with Einar as they try to form the farm so it was probably a good thing that Thorfinn went ahead with being a slave um, it, when you look at the slave arc you'll notice that Thorfinn Maybe being a slave, not just for the sake of attaining his freedom, but also by trying to, but also for finding freedom internally about how he can apply what he's learned from working in the farm and then apply that to a world to sustain this paradise that everyone's trying to fight for, but can only get too close to. And this paradise is further emphasized by even some small scenes that that should never be overlooked this is why like sign and stories like this can be superb for character development like you'll have small moments like thorfinn listening into snake reading the bible to the elder of the farm and even though Thorfinn at this moment in the story, as far as we're aware, is not a professing Christian, he's nevertheless drawn to the teachings of Jesus Christ, particularly the verses that say, if you only love those who love you, what good is there in that? Love your enemies as yourself. And you look at the reaction of Thorfinn and you realize it has a profound effect on him. It's the same kind of profound effect that it would have had on people like Gandhi or anyone else who would have listened to that kind of golden rule mentality. It's very clear that this show condemns the violent pagan lifestyle and very heavily endorses any kind of lifestyle that would promote peace and compassion with others yes there is a lot of action and violence in the series but that doesn't mean the series necessarily endorses war and violence it just means that it's a means to an end to further emphasize how important peace and compassion really is and it's interesting to me, as a man of faith myself, that Christianity is portrayed very positively here. And it's not just being used as some gimmick just to make something look cool or, or it's just there for the sake of being there. It's actually there because even though the author may not be an expert on it, he at least innately knows that it's very important to the history of Europe. So that sort of thing comes into play, as well as some ideals of stoicism and masculinity. But I think um, I could go on and on and on about these kinds of thing, themes, but it's evident that they keep going on with the eventual reunion between Thorfinn and Canute. Now, this moment showcases a very intriguing a clash of ideologies. That's This is one of the reasons why I actually really like this story, looking back now. It's the way these ideologies talk to each other about how they are trying to make a better world. So at this point in the story, we have Canute, who has embraced a utopian idea, has poisoned his brothers, and will do anything it takes to attain power to try to create the peace that he's seeking. Whereas Thorfinn has pretty much been humbled as a slave uh, due to Canute, and he is having a, a very opposite 
means to an end. Both of these men have a similar end goal, but a very different means as to try to attain it. Now, it's very clear that Knut is obviously portrayed in the wrong here, and Knut is most likely showcased as an antagonist to um, Dorfin. An antagonist that could really threaten him down the line. Now, are they going to meet again? I don't know, because during this conversation, it's clear that their end goals haven't really changed, but after the conversation, Thorfinn does manage to change Canute's mind to some degree, which further proves the point that you don't need to violently lash out against people all the time. Said violence should only be used for self-defense, and Thorfinn carries these new ideals from from the heart and he practices that and it leads to a profound transformation and at least this whole prodigal son reunion and it's um honestly this is the kind of story i could go on and on and on about about all the tragedies about all the ups all the downs about all the good things that happen all the these awful things that happen to some of these poor characters and even some of the characters that inflict some of these horrible, horrible things are just deeply broken people who are, you know, still horrible. So we can't o- overlook that sort of thing. It just goes to show that the show, it does a very good job at portraying a situation where all the human beings are pretty much messed up people. But at the same time, they're still accountable for the wrongs that they do. I think that's very true to real life, if you ask me, and from what I've experienced in the past several years, which led to a very similar disillusionment period that I went through, just realizing that I, myself, was capable of so much evil, even more so than than the people in the world. So in the past few years, I had to improve myself and my outlook on people, and now I'm at a state where... I don't treat people as things, as a means to an end anymore. I treat people as people who need help. And I'll help them wherever I can, just like Thorfinn is. So, honestly, for these reasons and more, I would highly endorse this show. There are a few subtle differences between the manga and the anime. Uh, One of them more overt, but the story is more or less the same. So... Make of that as you will in terms of adaptations. Please enjoy the show. If you want to see some of animation at its peak, watch this. I mean, obviously, with it being a television show, it's going to show its budget at times. But there are times where it has this sense of bloom, this immense sense of detail that the Eastern animation is known for. Even though frame rates do drop for certain character animations at certain points. And they do have, you know, that some corner cutting techniques like blanking out people's faces when they're at a distance or having fewer frames for like slower paced scenes there's just some scenes where the detail is just astonishing it's oh it's just you you just have to see it for yourself okay just just watch Vinland Saga and thank me later (laughs) anyway as for season two of Vinland Saga I think Gosh, should I give it a 12 out of 12? 11.9? Oh, gosh. Is it really that good? Is it? I mean, it probably is, right? Yeah, stuff it. 12 out of 12. It's it's amazing. Go watch it. (laughs) It's disgusting for signing out.